Uh, good afternoon. I hope everyone had a chance to uh, go outside and warm up a little bit before our afternoon session. Um, I, a couple of announcements. One, as we mentioned this morning, the workshop uh, locations have changed. They're posted outside. Uh, please check on it before you go up to the workshop this afternoon. And also, uh, those of you who are watching on the live webcast, um, please feel free to submit your questions via email and we will work to get them answered during the question and answer period. Um, I'm very pleased right now uh, uh, to introduce uh, Dr. David Spock, who's going to be talking about opportunistic infections. I think everyone should have their, their cell phone out, right, for the interactive part of the session. So get ready to answer some questions. David Spock is a really a brilliant uh, clinical um, teacher and clinician. Uh, has done the national HIV curriculum, as we've mentioned several times today, and is going to be uh, talking about new developments in opportunistic infections. Well, great. Laura, appreciate the opportunity to be here. And for all the dedicated clinicians here, I've been a long-term uh, HIV provider, and I'm thrilled to see everybody still coming to this conference and um, really uh, salute everyone for their dedication to HIV care. Um, what I'd like to talk about are opportunistic infections. And this is a tough topic because when we think about what's new in antiretroviral therapy, it's very easy to you know, rattle off uh, new developments, new drugs, and opportunistic infections. The pace in the development is a lot slower. So it's a little more challenging to come up with what's new and what's relevant. Uh, but that's been my task, and that's what I'm going to do my best to try and do today. I have no uh, financial disclosures that are um, uh, related to this at all. Um, so in terms of learning objectives, there's three major learning objectives. I have a couple other things as well, too. First of all, I'm going to discuss some new recommendations based predominantly on the uh, HHS guidelines regarding new recommendations for starting and discontinuing primary OI prophylaxis. Um, then I'm going to talk uh, briefly about a couple of vaccination issues, one meningococcal vaccine, and secondly, the new investigational herpes zoster vaccine, which I think is a game changer and will be a change in everyone's clinical practice, I predict, within about a year or two. Um, and this is a vaccine that I think will really uh, change how we approach trying to prevent zoster in, in our patients with HIV, and especially relevant as our clientele begins to age and age into the 50s and 60s. Um, and that's why I'm going to focus on that, even though that uh, vaccine is not currently FDA approved. And then last time, I'll talk a little bit about IRIS and sort of the whole juxtaposition of what happens when a person has a very advanced HIV disease. We start antiretroviral therapy and how we think about approaching iris and our choice of antiretrovirals and, and when and how we start antiretrovirals and I'm going to also talk about PML in that regard. Uh, and this is just the outline of the five topics that I'm really going to just give a little bit of background about where we are in terms of OIs compared to where we were 10, 15 years ago. And then, as I mentioned, discuss a couple of new issues related to prophylaxis, primary prophylaxis, the immunizations, a couple things related to when you stop chronic maintenance therapy, somebody's had an OI, maybe they've been hospitalized, now you're following them up in the clinic, and then when do you make that decision that, okay, now it's okay for me to stop their toxotherapy, it's okay for me to stop their cryptococcal meningitis therapy, and that's an issue that comes up in our clinic all the time, and I, I chose to address that. Um, and then, as I mentioned last, we'll talk a little bit about um, the risk of iris. Now, this is the world that we used to live in. The world we used to live in, this is showing a you know, gradual decline in CD4 count in someone who's not on antiretroviral therapy. Um, and typically over eight to 10 years, the, the CD4 will go down to a point where it reaches around 200. And this is when people start to develop AIDS-related complication. And that is really early in the epidemic what we saw over and over again. And these are the big five opportunistic infections that we commonly dealt with. And, and let me just ask for a show of hands right now, because this would be interesting to see. Just show of hands. How many people have actually themselves diagnosed a case of pneumocystis pneumonia in the past six months? Show of hands, okay. How about toxo, toxoencephalitis? Okay, great. How about um, PML? How many people have diagnosed PML? Okay, fascinating. So a fair number of people in the room have seen that. How about cryptococcal meningitis? Okay. And then how about disseminated MAC? Okay, great. And then last, CMV retinitis. Okay, so that's very interesting. So that within the room there, there's probably at least 
27%, no, just kidding. Um, there, there's, there's a good percentage, at least a third of the room with each one of these opportunistic infections that people have seen, maybe 40% or so, that have seen within the last six months. And one of the points that I wanna make is that not all of you are seeing these infections, um, even if they are occurring, because many people that are developing OIs now are developing them at the point where they're out of care or they're newly diagnosed and they're being admitted to the hospital. And if you're a primary care provider, you're in a clinic and you're predominantly doing regular care you, that's on a day-to-day -day basis, outpatient basis, you may not actually be seeing these people and making the diagnosis. You may be seeing them in follow-up, um, or you may be seeing them if they come in for an acute visit to clinic. So I'm going to try and touch on it, several different things. Now, this is the, the, the world that has changed. This is the, looking at the overall incidence of first age-defining opportunistic infections. And really, I chose this time period because this really marches through when we got very good antiretroviral therapy and good combination therapy. And you can see just a dramatic decline in OIs that occurred really throughout uh, the late 1990s that occurred. And this is really breaking it down by the different OIs. So it's interesting that sort of equal opportunity decline that, that really across the board, all the OIs went down. If you look at CMB, pneumocystis, MAC, there was a dramatic decline um, through these time periods, and really there's been even further decline since 2007 of these OIs. Now, this is interesting because this is breaking this down really into sort of three periods of antiretroviral therapy that we've had, sort of the pre-antiretroviral therapy um, before we had really good combination therapy, when we had mono and dual therapy um, in, in the 87 to 96 period, and then the, the combination antiretroviral therapy. And this is data looking at the five-year survival probability following uh, the first AIDS-defining opportunistic infection. You can see from the blue bar there that in that time period, a define, age-defining illness was a very clear marker of a high risk of dying. Uh, and only 7% of people in that group would survive five years. But you know, even in, in the 97 to 2012 period, you can see the survival is dramatically better. Uh, probably even better in very recent years as well, too. Now, one of the things that we've clearly seen with antiretroviral therapy are recovery in CD4 counts. And this is just showing you a really nice visual across the board of where people start with their nadir CD4 does make a big difference overall. These are median increases in CD4 by group, and you can clearly see that the lower you start, the bottom bar is people who started with CD4 count less than 50. Um, clearly those individuals do not rebound at, to the high level that most people who start at a range of 600 or so. But what you can see from this is almost all of these individuals do rebound over 200, not everybody. Um, and so there are some people who are so-called discordant non-responders that clearly don't respond. But overall, this day and age, most people are going to recover. And that is a population of individuals that we're, we're following. And I'm going to focus a lot on that bottom red bar and the talk. What do we do in our clinic when we see people and they're in this recovery phase, their CD4 counts are, are recovering? What about that initial period of initiating prophylaxis and antiretroviral therapy? What about discontinuing uh, in that group? The modern day that we live in is, you know, very predictable if things go well. We have uh, people, we start on antiretroviral therapy, their viral load goes down quicker with some regimens than others, but, but clearly this is what we're hoping to see when we're starting individuals on antiretroviral therapy. But what I'm going to focus on today um, as well is this period and this overlap and these individuals who have very low CD4 counts as their viral load is going down and they're developing immune reconstitution, if you overlap that and juxtapose this with a concurrent opportunistic infection, this is where clinical care becomes a lot more complicated. Not sure what happened there? Yeah. Try it. We'll wait a second. But that is where it becomes complicated. It becomes really complicated if the slides go off, too. <laughs> we'll wait just a second. So the, really what I'm, I'm you know, give me a second here. Okay, great. So what I'm going to focus on then um, are a couple of different areas, really. It's going to be this period right in here 
What's going on right in here with this juxtaposition? And then what happens out here? As the opportunistic infection has been treated, things are fading out, the immune recovery is really becoming good, what do we do out in this period as well too? Okay, so the focus is going to be to make this case based. so everybody grab their phones or tablet, laptop, whatever they've got, and I'm going to start in on some cases. As I discuss these cases, I'm predominantly gonna be focusing on the HHHS, um, the DHHS, OI guidelines, which I think everybody's totally familiar with, and that's what I'm going to be referencing to. And this is actually the rating system that's in the guidelines. And if you're not familiar with this, just remember that, you know, A1 is the highest rating that you can get. This is a strong recommendation based on uh, randomized clinical trials. One of the great things about the guidelines is they actually do take into account when there aren't randomized clinical trials and they come up with recommendations that are based on expert opinion, which I think for clinicians is very helpful. So when you see a C3 recommendation or a B3 recommendation or A3, that's based on expert opinion. Okay, first case. According to the guidelines, what is the criteria for stopping primary MAC prophylaxis in a person responding to combination antiretroviral therapy? Would it be number one, a CD4 count greater than 50 for at least three months? Would it be a CD4 count greater than 100 for at least three months? Or would it be a CD4 count greater than 200 for at least three months? Okay, so we have a discrepancy here between above 50. Now, we'll come back to this. So it's interesting that people that chose number one may have chosen that because they may not have initiated MAC prophylaxis in the first place, and I'll come back to that. We had a discussion about that yesterday. But according to the HHA guidelines, it's the answer, correct answer is actually the middle one, 100. So this is what the current recommendations are. This is an A1 recommendation. If you have a person you're following in your clinic and you have them on MAC prophylaxis, the formal recommendation for when dis to discontinue is going to be when they reach a CD4 count of at least 100, and they've been on good antiretroviral therapy with suppressed viral load for at least three months. Okay, now what about pneumocystis pneumonia? So a 26-year-old man is diagnosed with HIV infection eight months ago when in the emergency room for drainage of a skin abscess. His initial CD4 count was 62. His toxo -an antibody titer was positive. Um, he's been taking trimsulfa and antiretroviral therapy, uh, elvitegravir, Kobe, TAF, m for about eight months with excellent adherence. His HIV RNA levels have been undetectable for six months. CD4 count is now 134. So the question is, what would you do with his pneumocystis prophylaxis at this point? Would you stop pneumocystis prophylaxis? CD4 count is between 100 and 200. Viral load is undetectable, or would you continue? Okay, so 67% said no, um, so we've got a pretty interesting split here. Let me tell you what's in the most recent guidelines that just got updated about a month ago. So the formal and sort of the standard recommendation for several years now has been the top bar up there, that you can discontinue pneumocystis prophylaxis when the CD4 count has been above 200 for three months as a result of good antiretroviral therapy. And so we're assuming persons engage in care, they're on antiretroviral therapy, their viral load suppressed. However, that recommendation was modified uh, in July, about a month ago, and now, there's a B2 recommendation that you can consider discontinuing if the CD4 counts between 100 and 200 um, if, the CD4, if the HIV RNA level has been undetectable 
also for at least three months. It says three to six months. So this is a new point in the HHS guidelines. This was actually mentioned yesterday in the panel briefly, but I wanted to just underscore this. This is now formally in the guidelines as a consider recommendation. We've really been doing this in our clinic for a while, especially if there are any issues related to toxicity or bone marrow suppression or intolerance um, with trim sulfa if somebody's on that. But that's now a formal recommendation. Now, where did that recommendation come from? Uh, it came from this COHERE study, and I'm just going to quote it because it's a very complicated study. This is European data. It was a pro across 12 cohorts, and the bottom line, what they concluded was the incidence of primary pneumocystis pneumonia among patients who had virologically suppressed HIV infection and were receiving combination antiretroviral therapy and who had CD4 counts greater than 100 was low irrespective of prophylaxis used. Discontinuation of prophylaxis may be safe in patients with CD4 counts between 100 and 200. That recommendation has been out there, or that paper's been out there now for about six or seven years. In Europe, they've commonly done this, but more recently in the U.S., I think this recommendation has taken hold, as I think a number of individuals have become very comfortable with this, and this has been a practice in many, in many clinic settings in recent years. Now, just to briefly summarize, the three major OIs that primary care providers are prophylaxing against, and I should say, I'm not going to talk about tuberculosis at all. That's going to be talked about tomorrow. I'm not going to talk about STDs, as you know, Jeannie Morazzo talked about it. I'm not going to talk at all about hepatitis C. Um, but in terms of the three major OIs that primary care providers in HIV setting are, pre are, are preventing, these are just to summarize then the criteria in the most recent guidelines when you can discontinue therapy. So the pneumocystis and the toxo for primary prophylaxis, somebody who's never had those infections before, uh, they're the same. So it's the same recommendation for pneumocystis and toxo for primary prophylaxis. And then MAC, as we mentioned, was greater than 100 um, for at least three months. And we may see some changes in how we approach MAC overall, as discussed yesterday, and I'll come back to that right here. Um, we, we, we heard yesterday in the panel, there, there was a case presented that was really addressing this issue of, you know, if you have somebody and they come in, their CD4 count, let's say, is 20, and you're going to start antiretroviral therapy right away, should you start MAC prophylaxis? And here's what the bottom line is in terms of the two major guidelines that are out there right now. The HHS guidelines, the OI guidelines, which were last updated for the MAC section in 2013, say it is recommended for you to start MAC prophylaxis if the CD4 counts less than 50. But before prophylaxis is initiated, it is recommended that disseminated MAC should be ruled out by clinical assessment. And in this case, it may be uh, ordering blood cultures if there's actually a suspicion of infection. So that's currently where we're at. If you look at the guidelines page now, you will see that this section is under revision. So I do not know how it's going to pan out. I would encourage you all, maybe in a month or so, to look at the MAC section and see if it's revised further. But the IAS USA guidelines, which was briefly discussed yesterday, actually now recommend that if somebody is coming in and you're going to start them on antiretroviral therapy right away, that you would not need to uh, start um, OI prophylaxis for MAC. And, and that, the question is, where did that data come from, or why did ISUSA come up with that recommendation? Let me briefly lead you through what the data that led to that recommendation and may lead, I don't know that it will, but it may lead to a change in what the U.S., um, the, the standard DHHS guidelines will say. So interestingly, overall, the MAC profile, the MAC, incidents for disseminated MAC has gone down. Just like I showed you in those other graphs, if you look all the way to 2007, the, the incidence has really gone down dramatically. So first of all, it's just not nearly as big a problem as it used to be. But more interesting is a recent study that, a more recent study that actually looked at what's the likelihood of someone developing MAC in, if their CD4 count is less than 50, and based on whether or not they were getting prophylaxis. So these are incident MAC rates, and, and the gray bar is looking at all individuals with CD4 count uh, less than 50, and, and this is per 100 person year. You can see the rate is very low. That's the first thing, very low rate. But, but if you look over to the right and look at the two different blue, blue bars, it actually wasn't much different whether or not they got MAC prophylaxis. There was a slight difference with no prophylaxis. It was slightly higher than, than individuals who got uh, 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 it was slightly higher, but those individuals that got prophylaxis, it was slightly lower. But as you can see there, these are very low rates, not a big difference. But more interesting, when they broke down the data, again, 
The all bar there shows you just what I showed you a second ago. But if you break it down at the person's viral load at the time that they looked at this data, this is very interesting. If their viral load was greater than 10,000 at the time they, they, they enrolled them in this, yeah, there was a higher rate in the individuals that didn't, have, uh, that didn't receive MAC prophylaxis. But if their viral load was already down to the 1,000 to 10,000 range, essentially the, the, the group that got the MAC prophylaxis even had a higher rate. And then more importantly, if you look at the incidents in those individuals that had a viral load less than 1,000, essentially it was zero. So here's how you could look at this. There's a, you, know, you could look at it and say, well, if I'm going to get blood cultures and wait two weeks to see if I can start MAC prophylaxis, by the time you wait two weeks and get your blood cultures back, you're going to be over in that second or third part of the graph there. And you could see how the recommendation would be maybe it doesn't make sense to start MAC prophylaxis in these individuals because the data just doesn't support that it's going to change the outcomes. Um, it'll be interesting to see how the HHS guidelines uh, follow and whether or not they will be uh, in, in unison with the uh, IES USA guidelines or whether or not it'll stay the way that it is. But that's at least the data that led to that change in thinking. And this is the conclusion they had from that paper. Primary MAC prophylaxis may not be required in suppressed patients with CD4 count, in virologically suppressed patients with CD4 count less than 50. So it, it, it you know, it, that's not what the person has when they first come in. This, this article is slightly different than what the recommendation is, which is that as soon as they come in, but what I think that the IES USA guidelines is assuming is that you're going to get them suppressed fairly quickly, and that's the reason for that. Okay, now let me briefly switch gears and talk a little bit about uh, immunizations, and I view this as, as part of primary care, part of prophylaxis, and there are a couple new things in immunizations, um, and first of all, I'd like to discuss the meningococcal vaccine, and I'll make a couple comments um, after discussing this about the meningococcal vaccine and, and the data that Jeannie Morazzo talked about this morning as well, too. Okay, the question I'm asking you now is what does ACIP recommend for routine meningococcal uh, conjugate vaccine in adults with HIV infection? This recommendation from ACIP came out about a year ago or less than a year ago. So what's the recommendation? Is it number one, give one dose of meningococcal vaccine and repeat again? in five years, one time? Is it number two? Give two doses at least two months apart and then repeat once more in five years. Or number three, give two doses at least two months apart and then every five years, re-immunize them. So I'll have to say when this recommendation came out, the correct answer from the ACIP recommendations is actually the third. It is to immunize at least eight weeks apart and then you continue to boost every five years. So, you know, a lot of people that doesn't make sense to because there really isn't the data out there Clearly, there's not data. We haven't, we, there's no long-term track record with individuals with HIV where they've given boosters every five years and shown that um, has been beneficial. But yet, I think extrapolating on rapid declines in antibodies in, in individuals, I think that's where this recommendation comes from. And so just to quickly summarize then, the meningococcal vaccine that is recommended for adults with HIV infection is the conjugate quadrivalent meningococcal vaccine. And, and uh, you know, it's, vaccines are hard, but the two um, trade names for this are Menveo and Menactra. Um, but these are the serotypes that are in here, ACY and W135. In the conjugate vaccine, B is not in it. Um, there is a separate meningococcal B vaccine that I think probably almost all of you are aware of. And there's actually in development a pentavalent meningococcal vaccine that would have all four of these strains and the meningococcal B, but that is not uh, FDA approved and it's probably at least several years away. Um, and, and this was a recommendation that came out basically about a year ago. Now, why did this recommendation come out? And, and there wasn't a lot of real cutting edge new data, but there was sort of accumulation of data that led to this recommendation. There are some data from over about a you know, 20 year period or so uh, looking at 
cases of, of meningococcal disease in people with HIV. And what they found in this was it was a pretty equal distribution of B, Y, and C, um, and a smaller number of cases in W. And as you can see here, the, the vaccine will cover C and Y, but it doesn't cover B. So right away, you know, it's not obviously a perfect vaccine because you're, you're going to be missing uh, about 20% of the strains. And that's, you know, inherently a problem with the quadrant valent vaccine um, in the general pop younger population when it's used as well, so adolescents and young adults. Um, this data was 92% of the individuals with th this surveillance data was in individuals who were adults with HIV. Um, and so overall, what do we know about the epidemiology? We know that meningococcal disease is more common in individuals with HIV. It's estimated that somewhere between about a three to six fold increase in persons with HIV um, uh, in terms of meningococcal disease, in terms of just, uh, I'm sorry, about a three to six uh, uh, individuals per 100,000 persons with an overall relative risk of about a 5 to 10 to 15 fold increase uh, compared to people who are not HIV infected. So somewhere, you know, 5 to 10 to 15 fold increase um, in people who are not infected. The risk factors for, for individuals with HIV are low CD4 count, high viral load. The immunoge immunogenicity and safety data, um, there's actually two studies with the meningococcal, the so-called D, uh, which is the menactra, and there really are no studies with the Menveo and HIV, which is the CRM uh, conjugate vaccine. So there's limited data, um, and this is an interesting data that, that looked at you know, why are we giving two doses? You know, because there's this, they come in the clinic, they get a dose, you've got to wait two months, you give them another dose. And I should say, this is one of those vaccines that, although they say wait at least eight weeks, if you really read the recommendations carefully, they don't want you waiting six months. So it's close to that eight week time period is when you want to give it. So you don't want to order it and then see the person back a year later and give them the second dose of meningococcal vaccine. The recommendations are to try and squish that as close to eight weeks, but no sooner than eight weeks if possible. So you can see from this data here, um, if, if you look at the bar graphs, at four weeks, if you compare the two groups, in, individuals in the study who got one dose of the vaccine, or the blue bars, individuals enrolled to the two shots or the green bars. So after four weeks, it, you, know, you wouldn't expect that the, the two doses would give you an advantage because they've only gotten one dose. So you can see that first four week period, there's no advantage of the two doses. But if you go out to the 28 and 72, both in the zero group C and the zero group Y, you can see that there are higher titers in the individuals who got the two doses. And that was some data. Um, and I know Marshall's done a study in this as well too in the past, I think has been involved in one of these that was looking at meningococcal vaccine. But, but the data in this would suggest that you do get more immunogenicity after two doses of the vaccine. So this is one of the things that isn't talked about, that if you, if you actually cull this data out and drill down and look at it, which I think is very interesting and did not make it into any recommendations, if you look at the four 28-72-week data, um, and this is with zero group C, and you break it down by CD4 count percentage less than 15% or greater than equal to uh, 15%. And this study, I should say, by the way, was in adolescents and young adults. Um, and the vaccine schedule was zero in 24 weeks. I should say that as well too. So it was spaced out a little bit wider. But what you can see here is the individuals who had CD4 percentages greater than 15 clearly had better uh, immunologic responses. And, and I think there hasn't been any statements or comments about, you know, maybe this isn't a vaccine that's going to get good responses with very low CD4 counts. My own opinion would be is if you have an individual and you know they're going to, uh, you know, get a good response to antiretroviral therapy and their CD4 count's gonna go up. This is a vaccine, in my opinion, I'd probably wait a little bit before giving the vaccine, um, especially given that it's a, an uncommon disease. So what about serogroup B? There currently is no recommendation to routinely give this for in adults with HIV infection. You know, there, there are recommendations out there that's an optional vaccine for, you know, uh, young adults and adults going off to college, but this is not a vaccine that has been recommended for individuals with HIV. Now, let me switch over to the herpes zoster subunit vaccine. Just for a show of hands out of interest, how many people have heard about this herpes zoster subunit vaccine? Just show of hands. Okay, so at least for some of you, or a fair amount of you, this will be uh, new information and maybe updated information for, for the rest of you who've heard about it. Uh, let me just briefly ask a question. So which one of the following best describes the relative, I should say, effectiveness and safety 
of this investigational herpes zoster subunit vaccine when you compare it with the current FDA approved zoster vaccine, which is Zostavax, okay? So the, 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 the investigational one, is it more effective but not as safe? Is it less effective but more safe? Or is it more effective and more safe? Now, this is one of those questions. Talk about investigator bias. I've pretty much biased you strongly this at the opening comments here. So telling you it was going to be a game changer. So the, the bottom line answer for this is um, it is more effective and it is more safe. And this is why it could be a potential game changer. And let me explain why. So if we look at the, the varicella zoster virus and we look at the current zoster vaccine, um, and so just thinking about this, basically when you take either the chicken box vaccine or you take the zoster vaccine, really all you're doing is attenuating the virus. Um, and actually all of you should know that the amount of live virus in the zoster vaccine is very high. It's about 14 times higher than the amount of virus in the chicken pox vaccine. So you would never wanna mistakenly mix those vaccines up. For example, give somebody who's never, who has no immunity to varicella zoster, like an adolescent um, or you know, pregnant, or not a pregnant one, but just some individual and ac accidentally give them the zoster vaccine when you meant to give them the varicella vaccine. But, so this is live virus, there's a lot of it. And that's why there's been this hesitation to use this vaccine in individuals with HIV. And the other question is, how well does it really work with HIV? We really don't know. There's one study that Connie Benson did um, years ago and it looked to be effective and safe, but there was never published and there's really never been any real good follow-up data. So it's been one of those things where there's essentially no recommendation out there in clinical practice with this vaccine, except don't use it in people who have CD4 count less than 200. But otherwise, there's no real recommendation. Now, what about this new vaccine? What it is, it is not live virus. It is a subunit of the virus um, of, the, of a glycoprotein, which is a surface protein of varicella zoster virus. It is combined with a very uh, potent adjuvant and combined, this is a so-called herpes zoster subunit vaccine. For any of you that do general practice outside of HIV, this is also gonna be a game changer in your general practice. This is data right now for this investigational vaccine not in people with HIV, but I'm just showing you to give you an example. This is called the ZOE50 study. So this, is, this vaccine was looked at um, in individuals, two, two shots of it, not just one, but two. And if you look at the data across the age range in terms of the vaccine efficacy, I mean, this is kind of like looking at two drug antiretroviral therapy versus really good heart. This is essentially like, you know, the old zoster vaccine would be in here and we're looking at what is great combination anti, I mean, this vaccine is the real deal. The efficacy is extremely high. Um, and, and the most impressive thing perhaps is this is across out to uh, over age seven. And just to follow up from that, they did the Zoe 70, which is just looking at people over the age of 70 and even going out over age 80. Look how effective this vaccine was. And it's not a live virus. So it's very safe um, and extremely immunogenic. And they've actually done this in bone marrow transplant patients, which I think is a greater litmus test than HIV infection in terms of immunosuppression. It was very safe in that setting as well. What do we know about it in terms of immunogenicity in individuals with with, with HIV. So this is deceiving because this is a log scale. So these are impressive bumps up. But th uh, this is, I'm sorry, this is not in HIV, I should say. The, the, uh, that's the next slide. This is a study looking at, does this vaccine give you a response if somebody had the previous Zoster vaccine? So this is the question everybody's asking me is, you know, okay, well, what if my patient got the old vaccine? Can I give them the new vaccine? Will it do any good? So they actually looked at this and I actually know that they're putting this in um, this is public knowledge, but they're putting it in for the FDA approval. This is, I think, something that was presented also to the Vaccine Advisory Committee just very recently, about a month ago, this data, because they're essentially, I think, going to go after trying to be able to use this vaccine in people who've had the previous Zoster vaccine. Okay, so the blue bars are people who've, who've never had the Zoster vaccine. The purple bars are people who previously had the Zoster vaccine. Again, log scale, so these are big bump ups, but you can see 
it really didn't matter whether or not they had had the, pre, the Zoster vaccine in the past. They still got very good immunological boost from this vaccine, implying that it would likely be very effective in individuals um, who've previously been immunized. Now, what that time frame would be, I don't know. I haven't seen any breakdown of this data to know, well, what if my patient got it six months ago or a year ago? And, and we'll have to see how the advisory committee sorts through all this data. Um, this vaccine has been submitted for FDA approval. I, I think the vaccine approval is so much different than antiretroviral approval. It's very hard to predict when it will be FDA approved, but most experts in the field really feel like this is the real deal. This is going to be approved, and this is going to be something that I think will very likely replace the old Zoster vaccine uh, in terms of clinical practice. So what about data with HIV? And it's very limited. Um, there's some phase one, phase two data that's predominantly safety data, but they looked at three different uh, groups of um, HIV individ individuals with HIV who had CD4 counts between 50 and 200, 200 to 500 and greater than 500. And essentially giving three doses of this vaccine, they found that it was very safe and it was very immunogenetic. immunogenic. So uh, it looks like something that should be very good in, in individuals with HIV. I think it's really what we would want because it's not a live virus and it really shouldn't pose any risk or any greater risk to our clients than other vaccines that we're giving um, that are, you know, Poly, polysaccharide or conjugate vaccines or like the HPV vaccine where you're not giving live vaccines. So. Stay tuned for that and see, we'll see where that comes in. So let me switch gears to chronic maintenance therapy. Um, so now back to sort of the bread and butter uh, OIs here. Now, now I'm gonna talk about, okay, what about you're in clinic, you're seeing somebody in follow-up now, they're your responsibility, when can I stop their maintenance therapy? So they've had the disease. So this is a 33-year-old woman who's seen for follow-up after having pneumocystis pneumonia eight years ago. She's been on antiretroviral therapy. She's had an undetectable viral load for six months. Her most recent CD4 count's 158. So now the question is, when can we stop the trim sulfa? Can we stop it now? Should we wait till the CD4 count's at least 200 for at least three months? Or do they need to complete a whole year of pneumocystis treatment on uh, trim sulfa and CD4 count get above 200? Okay, so there's three choices. Okay, so the one thing that we can say from the guidelines that we don't need to do is actually answer number three. Interestingly, uh, and I was very surprised by this with pneumocystis, we, we really don't need to have any duration of therapy that's completed other than that initial 21 days and then the immunological recovery. So answer one or two would be considered consistent with the HHS guidelines. And let me actually then show you, this looks very similar to what I showed you in terms of discontinuing primary prophylaxis for pneumocystis with a slightly lower recommendation. So um, in terms of the rating. So basically it's the same thing for the top two bars. You know, you, you go from under 200 to above 200 for, for at least three months. Uh, and then you've got to complete that initial three weeks, which is really assumed that you're going to do. Um, but in the newest guidelines in July, they give you this recommendation again, that if their CD4 counts hovering between 100 and 200, and their viral load has been below the limit of detection for at least three months, that that's a considered now, it's the same rating as, as the top bar. The, the last one really re gets to this issue that, well, what if they got pneumocystis when their CD4 count was above 200? We don't see that very often, but, but that's a, a different situation. And some people would say if they got it above 200 and they were on antiretroviral therapy, the guidelines would even suggest that if they, they would need to stay on prophylaxis for life in that setting. Let's say their CD4 count was 300, they had a suppressed viral load, and they still got pneumocystis. That's really rare. But if that happened, you, you, you'd really sort of say, well, there's something else going on. We need to keep them on prophylaxis. Okay, so just to try, and as opposed to kind of going through these one by one, I thought I would summarize it for you. And this is really kind of the nuts and bolts of distilling for the clinicians what you would do in the clinic when people come back for follow-up with their OIs. Okay, so if they've had pneumocystis, I just went over this one. They got to complete their initial treatment, and then you've got the option of either 
choosing that above 200 for three months, or if you want to you know, be uh, more with the most recent recommendation, CD4 count between 100 and 200, and an undetectable viral load for at least three months. What about Toxo? Toxo is initial six weeks of treatment, they have to complete that, the so-called induction therapy with Toxo. But then they have to be above 200 for at least six months. This one does not have the option for the 100 to 200. So let me clarify that. Primary prophylaxis with Toxo, you now have that option. You can stop between 100 and 200. But with secondary or maintenance with Toxo, you've got to be above, you've got to get above 200 in terms of the HHS recommendations, the OI guidelines. What about CRM is cryptococcal meningitis? This one's more complicated. With cryptococcal meningitis, you've got to do induction therapy, which is usually AMFO plus 5FC. Then you've got to have consolidation which is a higher dose fluconazole, typically for about eight weeks. And then you have maintenance therapy, which is lower dose fluconazole. So notice for this, you, you've got to complete all of those. So with cryptococcal meningitis, these are not patients we want coming back. You follow them for a couple months after cryptococcal meningitis and stop fluconazole. These are patients you want at least a year on maintenance therapy. So that, that's a real difference than approaching the pneumocystis prophylaxis. Very important not to overlap and lump these all together. With MAC, disseminated MAC, again, one year of treatment would be recommended. Very high organism burden throughout the body. And you want to be able to have a, a prolonged therapy to get rid of all these antigens. And again, you've got to be above 100 for at least six months. And then CMV, um, for CMV retinitis, you have to have had at least three to six months of therapy and then uh, crossed over that threshold of 100 for at least uh, three to six months. So you can see that for the OIs, they're not all the same. The big one to keep um, you know, track of and remember is the cryptococcal meningitis is one that you're really going to need to have on a longer period of time. Now let me shift gears to the probably the most complicated situation, which is that triangulation to overlap of somebody newly diagnosed or out of care who has a major OI, you want to start them on antiretrovirals, and their CD4 and their immune reconstitution is occurring, how do we handle all of that? So we're talking about iris, so the immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome, which, for, let me just ask, show of hands now, how many people have actually seen a case of iris? We're both, okay, so a lot of people, that's almost everybody in the room, and I think depending on what pathogen, you've probably had various experiences. My own experiences and I have seen some really rough cases of iris with MAC iris and TB iris and PML iris. I think it's a really tough clinical problem. And that's why I'm going to focus on this a little bit. So here's a case of an individual. It's a 37-year-old homeless man who's admitted to the hospital with fever, confusion, and headache. He's diagnosed with cryptococcal meningitis and HIV infection. So his initial laboratory show very high viral load, 245,000. His CD4 count is 68. Um, and a, a drug resistance genotype is ordered. Okay, so the question I'm asking now is which antiretroviral regimen likely has the highest risk of causing iris in this setting? And this is just sort of preliminary data on this, but we'll see what people think about it. Is it number one? Tenofovir DF, m plus dolutegravir. Number two, tenofovir alafenamide, m being real pivorine. Number three, tenofovir DF, m being darunavir boosted with ritonavir. Or the last one, abacavir, lamivudine, darunavir, and cobicostat. What do you think? Okay, so, yeah, and people heard briefly about this yesterday in the panel this was mentioned that there may be some suggestion that the integrase inhibitors may be more likely to cause iris. Well, let me just show you what we know about it and just say this is not in stone. We don't really know the final data on this, but at least wanted people to have this on their radar screen so if they see more data come out about this, they will be aware. So where did this 
you know, notion come from? Well, it came from two studies that were presented at Croy, one that has been presented, one that has been published just very recently um, in the spring. So there's the Dutch Athena study on the Dad AIDS cohort, and then the Dutch Athena, they found about a 2.6-fold higher risk of iris in regimens that contained an integrase strand transfer inhibitor than a non-integrase strand transfer inhibitor. The DAT uh, AIDS cohort found about a two-fold increase in the integrase-based regimen. So this is what I would consider preliminary. It certainly isn't in anywhere in any guidelines, but it is something that clinicians should be aware of to have so that you are at least have heard of it and you're aware of it. And if you see this any guidelines anywhere, you at least know where that rationale has come from where people are talking about this. Now, where, where did at least the notion come for people to look at that? And as we've been hearing about, you know, over the last couple of days, you know, clearly the integrase-based regimens have a quicker response. And these are looking at how long it takes for people to actually develop an undetectable viral load. Um, and over a period of time, you can see that a raltegravir-based regimen, many more people get to undetectable at two to four weeks than with an efavirenz-based regimen. So clearly, the integrase inhibitors get you to an undetectable and very low viral loads much quicker than, and this is just showing you sort of, if you're more used to looking at it with virologic decay curves, clearly the integrase curves are steeper with their declines and you get a more rapid uh, fall off and, and a more rapid response in CD4 count. So this is where that data comes from and that's the rationale behind it, but sort of stay tuned on that. Now let me circle back to the real case that I presented, which is someone that has cryptococcal meningitis. And the question the, or the situation you may be thrust or may be thrust upon you is, well, if they do have cryptococcal meningitis, when do I start antiretroviral therapy? This is the most controversial of any OI because there's you know, data from different sources and from Africa where the, the treatment that was used in Africa wouldn't be the same that was used in the U.S. And so there's several different sort of competing uh, s studies on this. But I will tell you what the, the guidelines say, which is basically this. And the first two weeks of induction therapy with cryptococcal meningitis, AMFO plus 5-fusidazine, clearly I think there's consensus to wait. Don't start antiretroviral therapy that early. Then there's the consolidation phase, which is eight weeks of high-dose amphotericin. That is a period where the guidelines say you can consider. Um, and my own opinion would be, if you're going to do it in here, I probably wouldn't do it like right in here. It'd be more like out in this part of this consolidation period after they've had time, you know, six weeks in at least maybe. But then there's the maintenance therapy, which is essentially fluconazole 200 a day. And there's consensus that everyone should be on antiretroviral therapy by that point. So that's the 10 week period. This is the two week period. So it's somewhere between two and 10 weeks that you would start. And it is controversial in that period. You'll get different opinion from different experts, but it should not be in the first two weeks. Okay, let me now shift gears to PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. The first question that comes up is because this is such a bad disease, well, what can we do to better treat PML? So maybe the iris would be blunted or we'd have a better um, options for this. Well, the bottom line is the only therapy that has ever been shown to be effective for PML is antiretroviral therapy. And that is the catch-22 that you have to understand, that the very therapy that you have to use is the very therapy that's going to cause the immune uh, reconstitution with PML. So it is really, you know, you're definitely between a rock and a hard place with PML. There's no question about it. There are a number of studies, and a lot of people tout them, this drug works, this drug, but the bottom line is all of these things have been looked at, you know, uh, 5H2A receptor blockers, cetirabine, you know, topoisomerase um, inhibitors. There's a number of things that have been looked at. Mefloquine, none of them have been proven to be effective on, on, on treating PML. So we're really stuck with antiretroviral therapy. So now I'm going to ask you what you would do here. So a 31-year-old man has been in and out of care for HIV and recently hospitalized with a seizure and confusion. He was diagnosed with PML based on MRI, which is the, the test of choice for PML, not a CT scan. Um, and he has positive JC virus in the cerebral spinal fluid. He started on antiretroviral therapy and achieves an undetectable viral load six weeks later. Overall, he's improved, but eight weeks after starting antiretroviral therapy, he has neurologic deterioration. So the right thing was done at that point, which is to go back and look at his MRI again. And they look at the MRI again, it actually looks worse. 
the white matter lesions now have a lot of edema, um, and the, the, the neurologist and the radiologist say the most likely diagnosis is PML iris. So now you are in this situation, what would you do? So would you, number one, stop antiretroviral therapy, number two, start Maraviroc, number three, start high-dose corticosteroids, or number four, start rituximab? Okay, so great. So I think 81% chose the lesser of all the e you know, evils of what we can do here, and start high-dose corticosteroids is what's recommended. So a lot of people in this room have seen PML, a lot of people maybe have had to deal with this, and unfortunately that is really the only option. I briefly wanted to show you what is in the guidelines, but, but also just to illustrate that you know, this really is an extraordinarily difficult situation. I think the most difficult iris management situation you have because you really can't even pull off of the antiretrovirals and, and really hope that you're going to get some improvement. So you're really stuck with do you blunt the immune control or do you blunt the infam inflammatory response um, and take a risk that you're going to further immune suppress them with corticosteroids and the answer is as, as most of you chose. Now what I do want to point out though is what kind of doses of steroids you should use. So this is based on expert opinion but the guidelines actually recommend a pretty hefty steroid dose here. Methylprednisolone, a gram a day for three to five days, followed by essentially about a milligram per kilogram of prednisone, 60 milligrams a day, and taper that over one to six weeks. So the taper should based on, be based on clinical response. So this is a really tough situation. You know, you can get into problems with those kind of high doses of steroids, but it's clearly, I think, what most experts would do in that situation. Now, what I wanted to do is to sum up with the iris um, approach with all the major OIs in terms of when you would start antiretroviral therapy. So this is just now summarizing the, the timing for initiating antiretroviral therapy. Um, and this is complicated. And, and this again is based a lot of this on expert opinion because we're never going to probably know for sure. But with pneumocystis, the, the top one, the recommendation is it's fine to start within two weeks. It appears that there really isn't any sort of horrible pneumocystis um, inflammatory response syndrome, part of this may be that many people with bad pneumocystis are already on prednisone as part of, and, and that may be why that nothing has ever been sort of unmasked as problems with iris and pneumocystis with severe cases. But nevertheless, there is lysis of the organisms and release of a lot of inflammatory. So um, the recommendation with pneumocystis is to observe, but within two weeks. Toxo, the recommendation is sometime within a two to three week period. I think a lot of people practically think that a new diagnosis of toxo, most people would wait a week or two before doing that. The third is cryptococcus meningitis. I went over that briefly earlier, and that's that window where you do not want to start in the first two weeks. That's definitive. Somewhere between sort of two and ten weeks is, is when people would start. I, I would recommend my own is about six to eight weeks at least um, before starting it. With MAC, the recommendation is wait two weeks, and then as soon as after, after that, you can start prophylaxis. Um, part of that, you know, I mean, start uh, uh, antiretroviral therapy. Also remember, some of this is practical. You know, it's when the patient's being seen for follow-up, when they're being discharged, whether or not it's going to be done in the hospital or not. You know, you, you want to plan this out to what makes sense. These are meant to be general guidelines. Interesting with CMV, there isn't a long wait period. Um, it's recommended that you can start within a two-week period. And, and then last with PML, that's that's the one that there should be no delay. There should be no delay. There's no, re you know, you're going to, antiretroviral therapy is the therapy. So there's no reason to delay more than a day or so. You want to immediately get those people on therapy. Okay, in the last uh, few minutes, I have a few extra cases just to wrap up. Um, and these are just sort of little tidbits and um, things that didn't fit into sort of categories, but I wanted to toss out there. So a 43-year-old man with HIV infection who's taking no medications is admitted to the hospital with a seizure and diagnosed with toxoencephalitis. His CD4 counts 74. The plan is to start pure methamine plus leucovorin plus sulfadiazine. 
but you were unable to get paramethamine. Let me ask for a show of hands. Has anybody in the room had trouble getting paramethamine in the last year? Is anybody angry about it and want to raise their hand? Okay, thank you. So I think most people know the story about paramethamine where the drug was jacked up 7,500%. Um, This is an egregious egregious raise of a price of a drug that was a drug used to treat, you know, people with a very severe life-threatening problem, uh, and it just isn't fair. It was jacked up so high. But nevertheless, it has created a problem. Um, And there is a pharmacy now, for all of you out there to know, called Imprimis that has pyrimethamine, different doses of it with leucovorin that you can order it and it's very inexpensive or reasonably priced. And so I am P-R-I-M-I-S and I would certainly advocate that, you know, the, the other, uh, right now pyrimethamine is $750 a day. It's basically in the range of hepatitis C direct antiviral agents. Um, so anyway, that's a sidebar. But the plan is to start this, but you can't get it right now. So the question is, while you're waiting, what should you do? What should you start? Should it be Trimsulfa, Trimethoprom high dose plus Dapsone? Should it be Atovaquone or should it be Clindamycin plus Sulfadiazine? What do you like here for your choice? Lost our internet. Uh, we'll see if it comes back and say, Kristen, is that like a short-term problem or? Okay, short-term problem, all right. I, well, how about, I, I'll wait a second. If it's real short, otherwise we'll do a show of hands. Or I could go on about pyrimethamine for a while. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> okay, so why don't I go ahead and just say what the, the answer is here. Um, well, let me just ask for a show of hands. Or wait a second. They look like they're... Should I go on or... Okay, that's fine. We, we can skip the poll slide. That's fine. Okay, so the answer is, what, and this is actually in the guidelines now, if you can't get paramethamine, what you should do is start them on high-dose trim sulfa. Um, and if you've never done this before, use trim sulfa to treat toxo. It's not exactly the same doses that we use for treating pneumocystis, I mean, for treating pneumocystis pneumonia, which for those of you that have done this, if you're using, you know, oral medications is essentially two double-strength tablets three or four times a day or 15 to 20 milligram per kilogram per day divided over four doses. So the toxo dose for trim sulfa, um, great, thank you. So the toxo dose for, for trim sulfa, oh, here we go. That advanced, okay, great. So the toxo dose for this uh, is about half of that. So this is formally now in the guidelines it, and they addressed it because of all the problems people are having getting pyrimethamine. If pyrimethamine is unavailable or there's a delay in obtaining it, trim sulfa should be used, okay? So that is at least a good stop gap. But again, people should be aware that there is this other pharmacy and you can look at it online, you can order it. I got an email back from them confirming they do have it available. It used to be only you could get it if your clients were through Express scripts, but my understanding now from the email I got back is that it is available now for for people. Okay, now follow up on this person. After several days, you do get the pyrimethamine and you put them on the preferred first line OI guideline recommended regimen of pyrimethamine plus leucovorin because of the bone marrow suppression suppression from pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine. Now, do you need to add something else to this regimen now for pneumocystis prophylaxis? So you had them on high dose trim sulfa. That was taking care of the pneumocystis prophylaxis for sure. But do you need to use pneumocystis prophylaxis now? What do you think? Yes or no? Okay. Whoops. It it didn't show up. That's okay. So the the, the audience response didn't show up. Um, So I'll just show of hands. How many people would add something for pneumocystis prophylaxis? Raise your hands if you would. How many people would not? Well, that's great. That's great. It's exactly right. Sulfadiazine, the high dose, is effective, um, and the guidelines clearly say that. So let me now go to the last case. 22-year-old man. Uh, with HIV infection, CD4 count of 582, presents with bloody diarrhea and a low-grade fever. He's empirically started on Cipro 500 BID. 
Blood cultures are drawn. Um, in a stool multiplex, PC, multiplex PCR panel test is positive for Shigella. Quick show of hands, how many people now in their clinic or their hospital have access to these stool multiplexes if you do? Okay, if you've not seen these before, it's pretty amazing. You know, you, you order one test and you get about 50 pathogens, including, you know, Cryptospiria, Isospora, you know, all the bacterial. It's kind of amazing. And, a, and a very, the turnaround time in our hospital is less than a couple hours as well, too. So it's positive for Shigella. The question I'm asking you now is, <laughs> they're testing me here. Okay, there we go. So the question I ask now is, do you need to order stool cultures? Or are you good to go? Do you need any more data? Yes or no for stool cultures? Yeah, we had one response. And bias everybody. Okay, so stool cultures, yes or no? We'll see if this shows up. If not, we'll do old fashioned show of hands. Okay, so the answer actually is yes. This is a new recommendation just a couple weeks ago, hot off the press. Okay, so there are formal recommendations in the guidelines now that with Shigella, you need to find out the susceptibility of that organism for, for different reasons. Now, so stool cultures were obtained. And two days later now, they're growing out Shigella. And the MIC, minimum inhibitory concentration, is 0.12. The patient's a little better after two days of ciprofloxacin. Blood cultures are negative. What should you do at this point? Number one, finish off a 10-day course of ciprofloxacin. Number two, increase the Cipro to 750 BID and finish the 10-day course. Or number three, treat with an alternative agent like trim sulfa, maybe azithromycin, if the susceptibility shows that it's susceptible to that um, antibacterial. Okay, that's the last question. Okay, so that's great. So actually, about 50% of you chose the correct answer, which is you do not want to, at this day and age, use ciprofloxacin if you have an MIC of 0.12 or higher. This is a new recommendation just as of August 10th. And fluoroquinolone should only be used to treat Shigella isolates when the MIC is less than 0.12 microgram per ml. Reflex cultures of stools are positive for Shigella. Um, I'm sorry, reflex cultures of stools positive for Shigella by culture independent diagnostic test is required for antibiotic susceptibility testing. So if you get an identification of Shigella, you need to order stool cultures and go from there. The very last thing I want to say is I wanted to circle back to the meningococcal comments that Jeannie Morazzo made this morning and then I'll stop. Um, you know, Jeannie mentioned this very interesting study where there may be cross protection with meningococcal vaccine um, and gonorrhea. And so just to let everybody know, I, I had not heard about this study. I looked at it, Kevin Cormack and I were just talking about it a few minutes ago, but it looks like this study was done actually in New Zealand and it was done and published in, in Lancet just in July. So it really is very interesting. And there was a 30% reduction in gonorrhea in people who had received a old meningococcal B vaccine that's not even available now that, that was developed in New Zealand to deal with an outbreak back more than 15 years ago. So they were now looking at people who got that vaccine who were adults now, was there a lower risk of developing gonorrhea in those individuals? And they found a lower rate. So that's what we know about it, but it's tantalizing and it, I think it does raise the issue that now that we're going to be giving our clients a uh, conjugate vaccine, what's going to happen to, uh, you know, could it impact gonorrhea favorably? So it's a good thing for somebody to study in the future. Okay, I'm going to stop there. What I've tried to do is give a real overview of sort of what I think are some of the newer issues and in opportunistic infections, and I'd be glad to take some questions now. I think, do they have any funneling in by, by, but thank you very much for your attention there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Okay, anyone that wants to come up to the microphones? Please introduce yourself and where you're from. Yeah, Julio Roy, uh, Florence, South Carolina. Uh, patients with uh, varicella zoster virus infection uh, have uh, spontaneous reactivation of the virus throughout their lifetime, and this may be in the form of silent 
reactivation without any evidence of active disease. So therefore, one has to be tempered in terms of our enthusiasm as to assigning uh, protection with a specific vaccine when this is already occurring naturally. Plus, we know that in uh, infections that are latent, the presence of antibody does not mean protection whatsoever. It usually means reactivation. That's how we diagnose histoplasma and syphilis yeah. and, and varicella zoster virus. So in, in about a fourth of the patients, this has been shown, also occurs in non-HIV patients, but I have done a study recently and found that this is the same. About 22% of the patients had spontaneous uh, IgG, VCV IgG present without evidence of active infection. Great, thank you for your comments. I think that's interesting, yeah. Hi, Tom Giordano from Houston. Great, great talk, thank you. Um, comments on the, um, or I'm uh, interested in your comments on the meningococcal vaccine. The, the MWR um, uh, justification for rec the recommendation from ACIP, I thought was relatively weak as far as um, justification for an, a, a vaccine to be administered to a million people in the US um, with HIV lifelong. Um, I mean, just some back of the envelope calculation suggests if there's five per hundred thousand um, uh, person years, that means you're going to have 50 yeah. cases a year, and the vaccine is going to maybe present 25 of those because yes. it's not a great vaccine, and that might prevent, you know, a handful of deaths. Now, death's a bad thing, and we want to prevent death, um, but when they calculated the cost effectiveness, it was something like $750,000 per quality. So, and the evidence, all that evidence is based on very limited data. I, I was surprised to see such a strong recommendation based on, uh, granted it prevents a really serious disease, but it's a rare disease, thank God, and, and the data just aren't that great to support it. What do you, what do you think about that? So can, can, I have wait, to can say- I, Can I just add two more questions from the audience? You can answer all three together. Because we had a couple other questions along those lines. One well, is that- yeah, maybe I should just okay. address that first, okay. just because I think that's, that's, there's a lot in that. Um, so thank you for your comments. And I would say that we had a very similar discussion in our clinic when that vaccine came out. Like, where did this recommendation come from? And, and so that prompted me to want to try and hunt down where the data was for this. And I think your comments are well taken in that the cost effectiveness of this is hard to justify. Um, so all I can say is that, you know, that it is a formal recommendation to be out there. I don't know from the OI guidelines and from HRSA standpoint what kind, of, and that's part of why I wanted to present this because it is one of those things now where like our clinic started doing it, everybody's doing it, but, but it is a point of discussion. So I would say I, I don't really disagree with you that I was expecting to see some new data that had just come out that suddenly prompted the use of the vaccine, and there really wasn't. It was just more accumulation of the surveillance data. So I, I would have to agree that the recommendation of this vaccine at such a strong level was a surprise to me as well, too. Uh, and, but it is, it is an ACIP recommendation. Yes, yeah, so I guess the, some of the card comments, one was that it's not, uh, it's not in the OI guidelines. Correct, yeah. that is and correct. And the OI guidelines are not updated as regularly as the rest of the guidelines. Correct, so, so the OI guidelines for vaccines always usually lag far behind. Right, so that was another. And the other issue is that um, in many communities, a meningococcus in uh, people with HIV is largely in gay men. Yes. So that then you're sort of generalizing it to everyone when yep. epidemiologically it doesn't seem to be that way. And, 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 and I well. should say that, that, Tom, the thing that further surprised me was the recommendation that not only to give it, but then a clear recommendation to give it every five years. Um, and, and that, again, su surprised me when I saw that recommendation. That is what it is. And so what about uh, for, is there any differences for older adults, like people older fi over 50 versus younger people? So over 55, the, this, the, the conjugate meningococcal vaccine is not approved over age 55. The polysaccharide vaccine is supposed to be used, but the AC, ACIP recommendations, to my knowledge, really did not clearly address that. If somebody else knows that better than I do or somebody wants to speak up to that. Uh, but just in terms of product information and so forth, the vaccine is only supposed to be used conjugate up to age 55. 
and, and uh, turning out a PCP prophylaxis. Some recommendations, it was CD4 count of less than, CD4 of less than 14% or less than 200. Where is that right now? Right, so the recommendations now for less than 200 is the top bar recommendation, you know, an A1 recommendation. The recommendation for CD4 count percentage less than 14 is a B recommendation. So it is a recommendation, it's more consider. I think most people still do that if they have a, a client with CD4 count less than, four, less than four, percentage less than 14 and they're initiating prophylaxis, uh, they, they would do that. Now, in the newest OI guidelines, there's no mention of oral candidiasis as a clear indicator to initiate. That was years ago, they had that in the recommendations, but there is not now. It's just the less than 200 and then the less than 14 percent and an A and a B recommendation for those. And what do you do with people who have an OI at a very high CD4 count, like CMV at a CD4 count of over 200? When do you know when you can stop? So there are no recommendations or guidance for that with people over uh, 200. My own opinion is, in that case with somebody with CMV retinitis, number one, it would be very unusual um, because CMV is typically clustered down below 50, and it's one of those things that in my experience we even usually saw clustered below 25 for people, uh, almost the very last sort of stop on, on immunosuppression was, was CMV retinitis. So I think it's extremely unlikely and unusual, but if you did see that, I would clearly treat through for that recommended period of several months, probably at least uh, 12 weeks to 16 weeks. And I, in that situation, because it occurred at a high CD4, I would clearly have ophthalmologic clearance and, and have very close follow-up in that regard but if they then relapsed after that, then I would probably get creative and consider, you know, valgan cyclovir prophylaxis in that individual for a longer period of time. And what do you do with people that present with a very low CD4 count and never have good CD4 count recovery, like it's never over 50 or 70, but they've been undetectable for years? Do you so, continue prophylaxis? Yes. So, and I briefly mentioned this, there are these individuals who, who really do not respond to antiretroviral therapy and their so-called discordant viral load CD4 responses. And the reasons for that are complex, but usually they're related to several things. Number one, older age at the onset of antiretroviral therapy. Some individuals who've had cancer and have other severe immunological problems and have maybe had cancer chemotherapy and had bone marrow uh, at a younger age or had something bone marrow transplant. Um, and then some people just on other immunosuppressive or bone marrow suppressant drugs, and that's one thing that you can reverse. So from an OI standpoint, what I've personally done is basically follow where they're at with the OI guidelines. And if they, these are individuals though that a lot of them get above 100. And these are the classic individuals that they're hovering at 120 or 140, 150. And those are individuals I feel comfortable stopping their pneumocystis prophylaxis and, and, and stopping their primary toxo prophylaxis in that setting. The active uh, hepatitis B, uh, of course, we usually would utilize the same therapy for both, but what if one cannot uh, give the uh, Truvada uh, regimen, or are there any circumstances where one would uh, choose to treat first the hepatitis B with Entecavir, uh, particularly if it's a uh, you know, Severe case. You can, well, well, can you repeat that? Yeah. So, um, so the question I think is that if someone has hepatitis B, is there ever a time where you might treat the hepatitis B first? Was part of it with entecavir before treating the HIV? So, and, and maybe Arthur may want to comment on that because he, he probably could answer better than I can. But in general now, the recommendation has just been to simultaneously initiate therapy with combination therapy that has three drugs for HIV, two drugs for hepatitis B, and initiate that simultaneous. There currently are not any recommendations to actually initiate treatment for B first um, with an agent that supposedly had more selectivity for hepatitis B or to use PEG interferon. So the recommendations now in the, in the OI guidelines and in the antiretroviral guidelines are simultaneously start treating for hepatitis B and for HIV. Your, your point is, which is well taken, is that you can get these inflammatory reactions and immune reconstitution with hepatitis B. And the, and the guidelines actually have pretty good criteria where they give recommendations for what to do for monitoring that. And they give criteria that basically you can follow an 
ALT, AST elevation, I think it's up to about a tenfold elevation before actually discontinuing or stopping therapy or, or, or making any sudden changes. That's my recollection of the, of the guidelines. But, and the one thing I should say is that in terms of hepatitis B is that tenofovir alafenamide or TAF is clearly in now for as a treatment drug for hepatitis B, but telbibudine and adefavir and the most recent guidelines just as a month or two ago now are no longer recommended to use at all for individuals who are co-infected with HIV and hepatitis B. Great. And so uh, getting a little bit to the iris question, an iris question, patient that presents with a CD4 count of one and a viral load of 10 million disseminated TB, when would you want to start antiretroviral therapy in a patient so like that? So the, the TB, and, and maybe we should save that and let Sue come okay. on that tomorrow. I'll just That's briefly true. say that with TB therapy, it's a generally a staggered approach based on the severity of their HIV disease. And this is based on some studies that were performed in Africa where individuals that are like this, if they have severe immunological disease, um, uh, status or they have severe clinical status with wasting and so forth, that those are in individuals that in general um, you're going to approach a little bit different and going to probably wait two weeks because of the, the severity of, of, the, um, of the chance for immune reconstitution syndrome. And, and I, I may have, I'll let that let her okay, comment on that true. more tomorrow. I forgot that she's doing that tomorrow. So, um, that's a good question. It is a good question. Um, so somebody noticed there was an uptick of KS in LA County and was wondering if that if you had noted that nationally or there was any trends around KS. So I have not heard that. Um, and let me just ask for a show of hands. Anybody else in the room seen a recent uptick of KS? So, so the only thing that I could logically explain with that is that, you know, there is this belief that KS is a pathogen. It's very hard to figure out how it's transmitted exactly. And one of our ID fellows worked with Larry Corey and did this transmission study that was published in the New England Journal. It was really hard to sort out. It was very abundant in oral fluid. Uh, it's believed to be sexually transmitted, but why so dominant in men versus uh, heterosexual transmission, male to male transmission uh, is not known. But my only hypothesis would be or thought about this would be is if, you know, based on uptick in STDs and other things, if this really is a sexually transmitted pathogen, that maybe it could be a change in sexual practices that could be related. Uh, I can't explain. The, the only other explanation I would have is that there's some belief that protease inhibitors are the best drugs against Kaposi sarcoma, and the major shift over to integrase inhibitors could be the only explanation that I could think of for that. But that seems like we would have seen more of a, a signal for that in recent years. Earlier. Okay. Uh, the last question just is your slide weren't published previously, and we don't usually publish the case slides. Will yeah. they be available? I, I'm happy to share any or all the slides. That would really be up to um, ISUSA, but from my standpoint, if people They're would like the slides, I can ask if we can have them, if that would be helpful. Great. Thank so, you yes, so thank much. You. Thank you. I'm now uh, pleased to introduce Arthur Kim, who is an associate professor of medicine at Harvard, who's going to be talking about assessing approaches to managing hepatitis C infection. Great, um, and thank you to the organizers for uh, inviting me to uh, speak on this topic, which is near and dear to my heart. Um, when I first met um, uh, my first co-infected patient, uh, she was, um, at the time, hepatitis C was not in the HIV curriculum, like the materials <laughs> handed to us, uh, because it was so much on the back burner, so many OIs, so many things that were threatening life. And then uh, over the last couple decades, we've seen, uh, unfortunately, too many people not be able to address their hepatitis C for a variety of reasons and, um, and unfortunately succumb to that infection. But on a hopeful note, uh, I think in the last couple years, um, we've seen really a revolution in uh, therapeutics that has um, uh, provided us an opportunity to um, really take a step back and say, what are we doing to really make this uh, infection go away in our HIV clinics the way several of these other infections have, um, have mostly, but not completely, gone away. And so that, that is our hope. And I, um, the goal of a 30-minute talk on hep C is, uh, can be very challenging because um, 
Uh, there are many different topics to cover, and I know some of you are deeply involved in it and some of you more refer. And so trying to match the talk to everyone's needs can be a little difficult, but if you'll bear with me, I know there'll be some basics for some of you and some sort of uh, additional, hopefully everyone will get something. I have no financial affiliations to discuss. I will um, be discussing off-label use, particularly for uh, acute hepatitis C, if I mention that. Uh, the ideas here are that uh, even if you're not directly involved in curing hepatitis C in your clinic, you can describe uh, modifiable risks for liver disease progression. Uh, you can optimize choice of antiviral regimens and understand the principles. Uh, and also describe the rationale for enhanced screening, prevention, and treatment. And in the end, um, we're really hoping that someday we'll do away with this talk because we will have eliminated hepatitis C from our co-infected uh, patients. So from our HIV clinics. And so uh, a tale of two viruses. Um, these viruses are, of course, travel together due to risk factors, but it's well known that, um, that HIV is more transmissible via a transmucosal or sexual sort of um, uh, exposure versus a blood exposure. Um, like the, after a needle stick, the risk of HIV, especially nowadays, as most patients are, are um, suppressed, is, is virtually uh, minimal. Um, there hasn't been an occupational transmission in the United States for uh, about, about 20 years to a healthcare worker. I think there was one laboratory accident many years ago. Um, and then if you think about hepatitis C, it's much more associated with blood rather than sex. And so what's the big sort of word association with hep C that most of us and the general public have? Injection drugs, right? So, um, so blood um, exposures, especially if done regularly. Um, they target different cells. There's, of course, a latent period between uh, when a patient is infected and while they may be symptomatic in the initial phases, there's a high varying degree of symptomatology to, uh, for both infections. And the vast majority of hepatitis C are, um, transmissions are asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic. Um, and that really presents an opportunity it's both a challenge in, the, in that patients don't present, but also an opportunity for screening high-risk individuals. And of course, it takes longer for hepatitis C, usually 30 to 40 years on average, to uh, reach uh, the level of cirrhosis where one is worried about the liver. Um, they each are infections that establish high levels of viremia, and you can picture that sort of um, churning out of the virus and um, millions and billions and um, uh, particles being um, made each day and any sort of selection pressure, whether it's immune pressure or whether it's inadequate drug pressure, would allow uh, the virus to mutate. And so hepatitis C displays that same principle. However, the main difference is that today we can cure over 95% of individuals with hepatitis C. And I'll sh show you the latest data, which pushed the numbers even higher. And to my knowledge, there's one sort of verified long-term cure. I, I won't go over the IAS sort of uh, new data. But um, the main issue is that over the many years that we didn't have these effective therapies that I'll tell you about at the end, um, hepatitis C was kind of allowed and, um, to expand and be ignored, put off both by providers and by patients. And, um, and here we're seeing the lines cross between the number of deaths of HIV listed on a death certificate in our country versus hepatitis C listed on a death certificate. And you see those lines crossed um, uh, a long time ago. And these are new lines that show 59 other infections uh, 59 of them. Now, some of them don't kill you. They include notifiable conditions like chlamydia and whatnot. But still, there's tuberculosis on this list, pneumococcus, and other things. And so those lines crossed in 2012. And so um, even, even today, if you look around the wards, look around our ICUs, there are people dying of liver failure due to this infection. And so these, um, these drugs are arriving really sort of both in the nick of time for some, but also too late for many. It's been well known for many years that for HIV and hep C, when one has them together, that one sees accelerated fibrosis, if you've heard that term before. So when we picture a patient who has had this infection for 20 years and they don't have HIV, we may say, you may die with your hep C rather than of your hep C. I will point out that hepatitis C disease progression is not a linear thing. And so we do see uh, some people, even in mono-infection, accelerate in terms of their disease progression uh, in a rapid basis. Um, sometimes um, we believe that there's a protective effect of um, female hormones, like women tended to progress um, less quickly than men. And um, we are seeing uh, some effects of menopause on uh, women. And I have a few patients who really rapidly progressed in their fibrosis after menopause. Um, but uh, really, HIV is one of the well-known factors that accelerates this disease process. Um, and so um, just 
uh, even in the ARV era where many patients are suppressed, we see that on average, you you know, the whole disease process takes about uh, a decade sooner uh, on average. Now, um, when one reaches cirrhosis, then HIV, uh, if you take patients with cirrhosis with or without HIV, shown here in a, in a large database, you begin to see their survival curves diverge. So e again, even in the era where we can suppress the, the HIV, which is a very good thing for these patients because that obviously improves mortality not only from these OIs and other threats, but also due to hepatitis C. But even in this era, we see the, these divergences occurring. And so it remains an urgency to, uh, to treat this population, to identify, to evaluate, and get them through the various steps necessary. Um, and unfortunately, there are sometimes too many steps for some. And so uh, just jumping through all those hoops has proved to be one of the major problems. So to summarize uh, the epidemiology very briefly, um, we do see, um, uh, I'm sorry, the natural history, I should say. Uh, we do see uh, HIV hep C co-infection remains as double trouble, even in the um, ARV, this, the uh, modern era of ARVs. And so uh, we will um, hopefully make huge efforts um, in this room to, again, try to abolish this talk in future conferences. So here we go. So thinking about that, what would you view as your greatest need? I'm going to force you into one choice. So is it to identify everyone that you have because you're not sure what your burden is, enhance screening? Is it for those who are at high risk to prevent having effective harm reduction? Is it access to staging? You just can't get your patients staged for whatever reason, for their liver disease? Is it your knowledge about the novel therapies? Is it adequate pharmacy support? Is it improving no-show rates to your hep C-related clinic appointments if you're referring to either someone like me within your clinic or if you're uh, referring to hepatology? Or is it your capacity to fill out prior authorizations? <laughs> Just choose one. You, you may have many of these barriers in your clinic. Do I hit this? Yes. Ah, it's capacity. OK. Um, yeah, so, so God bless the souls who are filling out these PA forms. I know this is a predominantly provider MD-based conference, right? Is that, is that the demographic here? So, so all of those folks, um, how many of you fill out your own PAs to their entirety without any support? All right, how many of you have some support? All right, there you go. Those people are saints, right? Because they're dealing with all those crazy faxes. Oh, we couldn't read that line here. We reject you. Um, you know, this. Yes. <laughs> yes. Amen. Do I hear an amen? Yes. OK. <laughs> Um, but in terms of other barriers, that improving no-show rates is actually really critical because even if patients have heard of these new therapies um, within the co-infection clinics, within their support groups, within other patient navigators who are telling them about uh, hep C therapies, you should really go see that guy or that, that woman in the clinic. And there, uh, you see that's next. And I do have to say, no-show rates, even in this era, remain very high. And it's like, uh, I don't know, it's if your shoulder hurts and you're referred to uh, orthopedics, you go and see that orthopod because you want your shoulder to get better. Hep C is kind of one of these things, it's like more like your timing belt on your car. Like, when are you going to go take care of it? Ah, I'll put it off and that sort of thing. So, um, but life happens and pa many patients put it off. Um, there are other, um, obviously, social, psychosocial, um, psychiatric comorbidities in this population that interfere with that, that no-show rate. So I do agree that, that showing up is really important. When we think about controlling an epidemic, such as hep C in your clinic, um, there's typically a pretty high prevalence. So I don't know what it is for you. It probably results vary. It depends on your mix, perhaps, of MSM versus um, people who inject drugs in your clinic. It can be as high as 30% in some uh, clinics um, from, the, from the 80s and 90s epidemic due to heroin. But um, uh, what we're seeing today, unfortunately, is that um, we are seeing more groups at risk, and we'll go into that a little bit, both due to the rising opioid epidemic as well as risky sex. And we have this situation where many people are out there and they don't know they have it, or they think they were tested and were negative, but they're wrong, or they think they were positive, but they cleared the infection, and so they're using and sharing, they're misclassifying themselves. 
There's lack of preventive services in many parts of the country. There's um, asymptomatic infection within the prevalent group, and then there are barriers to care on the other side. So even if you get a patient identified, staged, and ready to go, you get that rejection letter from your Medicaid or from your insurer saying, no, the patient does not have enough sickness, does not have enough fibrosis to be treated. And so that middle remains very full, despite the fact that we could open that floodgates and really pour people out into, into cures. Uh, this is a summary slide of, of, of a great body of data talking about the new epidemics in HIV-positive MSM. I shouldn't say so new anymore. It's been well appreciated, particularly in Europe. Um, very high rates, and I'll show slides on that. But this is related to sex, drugs, and not rock and roll, but HIV. The syndemic, so to speak, of behaviors that drive the ability to, of patients to um, uh, meet up and, and uh, engage in higher risk behaviors that result in enhanced transmission. And, you know, it's not necessarily intravenous drugs. Um, some, some of these outbreaks have about 20% rates of intravenous. Um, it's not directly sildenafil or the internet that just uh, facilitates the meetups. Um, but the others, like um, blood exposures and semen exposures, it's really the presence of blood uh, during sex that seems to be uh, falling out as the main sort of risk factor. And you can then picture all the different activities that could uh, enhance that risk, such as um, fisting, ulcerative STDs, and whatnot. And then um, HIV itself may confer some risk. Higher uh, levels of hepatitis C RNA in a drop of blood, which may or may not translate into the semen, as well as local defenses are lower, perhaps in the rectum. One of the first hits, as you recall, in HIV is that hit to the gut-related uh, uh, CD4 cells, the gut-related mucosa, and that does not fully reconstitute in all individuals after, even after early uh, ART. And so this together really results in, in greater transmission. Now, one interesting thing that I get at, uh, HEPs, at HIV conferences, especially those initiating PrEP, and I, I saw the PrEP rooms were packed yesterday. How many of you are involved in PrEP? Keep your hands up. How many of you have seen cases of hep C? There you go. And this is an HIV negative for them, right? Because they're in PrEP population and a newly sort of access. These are young males. And, you know, I think uh, many, uh, half of us maybe were young males once. How often did we go to the doctor, right, to, to get our screening? So now we're accessing new groups of young males and we're finding hepatitis C that isn't necessarily related to uh, injection drug use. So it's rather interesting. These are the high rates in various cities in Germany, France, uh, London, that were seen in HIV cohorts. You can see these incident rates rates really peaked quite high, 21% per year in, one, in the Paris outbreak, uh, really quite remarkable. And in those cities, they could even, by you know, tracing the virus, locate which neighborhood. You say, you have a genotype 4 in Paris, you probably live in this sector of Paris. I mean, that's how um, th this outbreak was traced and could be spread. Um, we have very few data in the United States, but this study by Natasha Martin at the UCSD clinic um, looked at different time periods and suggests an increasing rate over the last um, uh, many years, um, over these different intervals into 2012 and 2015, and found that if one recorded crystal meth use, it was higher. Uh, there's a talk tomorrow, I believe, on all this, on the opioid epidemic, and so um, this is just a slide illustrating, as I think anyone in this room knows, the rise of opioid use, particularly many jurisdictions. I won't ask for a show of hands, because I think that'd be everyone who's seen this in one form or another in your state, in your region. And just showing the, a little bit of the demographics, that we're seeing the heroin deaths, particularly in young people, and that it is rising, among, particularly amongst white persons, um, uh, whereas young African Americans Americans are not um, uh, seeing this as much. And while it's a, a little bit uh, uh, an unfortunate testament that suddenly, because it's affecting white people, we're getting a little bit more uh, governmental attention on a federal level, um, that doesn't feel too great. At least um, there's some bipartisan thinking about this. Uh, I won't go any further this week into that. <laughs> Um, but what happens if there's not harm reduction for these individuals? And I think, again, anyone here from the great state of Indiana? Wow, nobody? Okay, I was just there like earlier this summer, so that's... Um, so anyways, Indiana, in this area, uh, Scott County, Indiana, if you haven't heard, there was a, 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 a 
a, a couple, there was four cases, I think, of HIV in a quarter when usually there's like a couple per year. And then they said, well, that's funny. And they started looking into it and started tracing things. And lo and behold, there was a whole network of, it was 135 as of the CDC report, up to 180 cases identified in a network of predominantly injection drug users. They were using oxymorphone. And this really illustrates both what happens when there's no harm reduction. If you've ever heard someone speak on this outbreak, it's really, really quite remarkable that they were reusing needles and syringes because none were available. Um, and they were dipping them in you know, cleaning liquid so many times that all the markings were gone. And they were using nail polish to mark their syringe as their own. The needles were all bent and just you know, kind of gross. And then the other issue is that oxymorphone can be crushed. And it requires a larger syringe. Not, you can't just use an insulin needle. And so there's higher dead space. If you recall, that's really an important factor for HIV survival within syringes. And so um, around this HIV epidemic was really a larger several hundred people with unrecognized or really undiagnosed. I mean, you could guess that they had it due to the injection drug use, but there was um, a, a lot of hepatitis C around here that was largely ignored. And it emphasizes the importance that in this day and age, we still require really efforts related to hep C prevention and vaccine. Now, I won't go over each of these elements, but uh, these are really all parts of things that I think people are doing as part of, hey, prep clinics or as part of any sort of HIV testing and counseling, you're encountering this population. Um, and then referral to harm reduction services is really important. And in fact, it enhances hep C outcomes if one um, identifies hep C in the population. How well do we screen in HIV clinics? Well, really, um, this is looking again through some eras. And if you recall, the guidelines once upon a time would say test for hepatitis C at baseline, but did not provide original guidance as to when to test again. And um, what they found was uh, uh, that nearly all patients were screened. You know, we're good at that checkbox and drawing that huge number of tubes of blood at the first HIV clinic. But then repeat screening was like hit or miss. Even when ALTs rise, which is a sign that something's going on and probably not hepatotoxicity, it could be hepatitis C. And, and even then, they did not look for in incident hep C. You see one clinic, if you can kind of squint, that uh, did decide uh, between 2007 and the next period to say, hey, let's increase rates. So really, the site of care was most important. It was the dedication of that clinic to decide, I want to identify hep C. Now, four years ago, I, asked, I did a sort of database search. Uh, do, do all of you have databases? Yes? Yeah? Yeah. OK. So you can do a, a search and see. And we, we were doing quite poorly at this academic center. Uh, and then um, basically, I used GILT. I published everyone's rate next to you know, every, um, blanks of everyone else's and said, this is your rate compared to everyone else. And suddenly, it doubled the next year. Now, ironically, at the same time, we were trying to screen everyone for syphilis. And so we wanted to um, do that. And so as part of like the hospital gave us some money and provided like $500 for each provider if you could get your rate above 90%, our syphilis screening rates went to 110% because we were checking syphilis rates so often. So it shows you what motivates physicians, a little <laughs> carrot perhaps. All right, so um, another way to increase testing, and uh, I know Barbara, Hi. in the back has been doing this work here in San Antonio, but trying to increase rates of testing both for the baby boomer population, if you hadn't heard, that's the really highest prevalence population. Um, and they instituted at the uh, Beth Israel Deacon, as uh, Cammie Graham worked with the lab to institute an electronic prompt. And you can see that despite the testing guidelines coming out and uh, maybe a little bit of trend upwards, it was really just seeing that prompt that allowed providers to react. So it's just an idea for many of you who are thinking about this. So screen for the high-risk behaviors. Screen those who are engaging in those behaviors with yearly antibodies. And unfortunately, behaviors are often not always told to you. So they might be um, not wanting to tell you about the high-risk behaviors. React to the minor changes in liver function tests. Remember the seronegative window, meaning that um, there can be a period of time where the antibody doesn't work, and so you want RNA testing. Uh, particularly in the first three months or so after an exposure. And once infected, unfortunately, the antibody remains positive and you need hep C RNA. So what's the greatest need in your clinic to prevent new cases of hepatitis C? Is it the high-risk sexual behavior? Is it really the substance use? Is it um, patient awareness or provider awareness? Some not right answer questions today. 
just to get some thought. Okay, go. Okay, so it, it really is um, a, a perception that the substance use, and I, I imagine it's both crystal, for which uh, replacement is not so easy. We don't have a, uh, a, you know, buprenorphine or, or a methadone uh, a replacement for that, uh, you know, as well as alcohol use in our clinics. Now, um, just in terms of treatment and try jiggling the liver is the caption, I will point out that's not FDA approved for the treatment of hepatitis C. Again, shutting down HIV is critical, and I, uh, in the interest of time, I won't go over this. And now, when you weigh the benefits of the treatment of HIV versus the harms, we, with modern regimens, we don't see the steatosis, insulin resistance, and hepatotoxicity levels of previous regimens. Uh, and so, really, it does add up to shutting down this whole cascade. Now, one aspect, we all know about alcohol reduction, but um, uh, there's also data, there are data showing that coffee is related to lower, I happen to have a visual prop here, um, is l related to lower mortality in our co-infected patients. And so this is uh, one study which looked at deaths in a large co-infected cohort, and you see the risk factors associated with death that would not surprise you, things like low CD4 count, unstable housing. You see a protective effect of both female gender as well as um, being cured of hepatitis C, lowering the rate of death by quite a bit. You see uh, alcohol, of course, and the French define it as more than one glass of wine a day, uh, different uh, criteria than us. But here we see three or more coffee was protective even after controlling for those other factors. So yes, um, I uh, must mention I don't have any stock in Starbucks, um, but... Um, coffee is beneficial. Usually that gets like a clap somewhere out of an audience or yay, all right. So what you're doing for yourself is, uh, uh, I get asked this question a lot. And so because use is so high in our co-infected clinics, um, uh, in our HIV clinics, cannabis. Um, now there, there's data to suggest one way or the other on a basic sort of fibrosis level when you look at um, various studies. And there's one really early study that suggested uh, daily marijuana smoking was associated with steatosis. But then more recent data that when they looked at marijuana use in, in a variety of studies show a neutral effect. I emphasize to my patient that I'm meeting that it's neutral, not beneficial for the liver, but um, uh, and so, and then there's a wide variety, and I wish I could go into this more, of, um, of extrahepatic manifestations or um, I think hepatitis C contributing to these other comorbidities and of cardiovascular disease, of stroke risk, um, renal disease is well established, and uh, surprisingly bone fractures. And we heard a, a talk on aging and yesterday and um, uh, all, all comorbidities we wish to avoid. And really the question going forward is, will this reverse as hep C is, is cured? So in the last six minutes, I plan to cover all of treatment. Woo. Which of the following eight-week antiviral combinations is greater than 95% effective for all genotypes of hep C if applied to never-treated patients who do not have cirrhosis, so kind of an easier-to-treat population? Is it sofosfavir, valpatasvir, lodipasvir, sofosfavir, glucaprovir, piperidazvir, simipreprovir, sofosfavir? I can't use brand names. Not allowed. <laughs> Okay, who's tired of the music? Let me sleep. It's tough in the late afternoon. Okay. Oh, it's coming back. Just when I was. All right. Let's see what the answers are. I think most people have looked up from their phones. There we go. Interesting. So, um, so. There's several, I mean, this is a confusing question, right? Because you have got a lot of things going on, but you have eight weeks, you have um, uh, which combination and all genotypes. And so many of you probably heard all genotypes and went to sofosfavir or valpatosphere. Turns out eight weeks is less effective and the cure rates fall below 95% for that regimen. Lodipazir sofosfavir is a good choice because you can use eight weeks, particularly in patients with lower viral load and without cirrhosis, so kind of who have never been treated. So that fits, except lodipazir sofosfavir is really considered, not considered pangenotypic. 
So it's this other one that I barely could pronounce because I've only said it a few times in my life, is uh, just FDA approved. And so really treatment choices may be more like this, where it says we're going to run some tests to see how your insurance reacts, and then you'll decide <laughs> what medication you'll give. And of course it's confusing um, when you've all sat through a hepatitis C treatment slide, which really, a talk which really deserves a full 30 minutes, and I deliberately did not do that, and I hope that some will come to the, to the next um, workshop to learn more. But if you've been involved in the treatment, you know what I'm talking about, where you're applying um, a variety of different classes of agents. I showed in a rainbow fashion, but really green are first and second generation protease inhibitors, NS5A are blue, and then purple are uh, the, um, the polymerase inhibitors, and then just I unfortunately use the same colors, but then you're applying them to different genotypes. And so this may help you follow in the next sort of efficacy slides, and there is a glossary um, when you receive the handout. Of course, we're not using interferon or first-generation protease inhibitors, and now we're really, really going to be hard-pressed to use ribavirin with our new options. Uh, this slide was updated, so excuse some of the formatting issues, um, and was recently updated to show uh, some new approvals. And so we're basically not using anything in the first two columns, right? Interferon gone, first generation protease inhibitors gone, and it's really about these fixed dose combinations that are available, uh, depending on your uh, insurer. And then some are approved for different genotypes and whatnot. I keep it color coded um, and try to keep it in alphabetical order here. And then some are um, approved for um, co infection which is great that, that co-infected patients were included early on, and there's some initial phase three trials that actually just bring co-infection in there as a proportion of them rather than delay and run co-infection trials. And so Cefosrovel Patisvir now is an asterisk, so it's the most recently added uh, version. And really, the summary of the data are that HIV patients respond exactly the same uh, with the same patient... Um, patient characteristics, like if you take a cirrhotic, naive patient who's mono-infected and co-infected and apply the same medication, you get the same results. And so this recommendation from the ASLD-IDSA joint recommendation suggests that you can use data even when, you're in the, when you don't have data, particularly for co-infection, um, you can look up data. And of course, management of drug-drug interactions remains key. Uh, Ledipazir sofosivir is probably the most widely used because genotype 1 is so common, uh, 70 plus percent, as I showed you earlier, and um, as well as for genotype 4. And here you see the efficacy rates in co-infected patients, uh, with or without cirrhosis, with or without interferon experience. The sort of upgraded, I guess, if you think about it, um, sofosivir velpatosphere, which uh, replaces lodiposphere with, with velpatosphere, is now pangenotypic and can cover um, uh, multiple different genotypes. And I don't show you the mono-infected slide in the interest of time, but here's the co-infected slide, and this resulted in recent approval and is probably your first choice now for genotypes 2 and 3, um, whereas even though 1 and 4 also look very good, they probably still have a better deal for your other drugs, so you may still be using lidipazir sofosphere. But I wanted to tell you in a minute about uh, the hot off the press glucapavir um, and just approved, um, and the data in co-infected patients. And what's interesting is that um, it's 8 versus 12 weeks, so you're able to now lower to 8 weeks um, in the blue bar versus... Um, uh, uh, and you can see here that, that the rates are closing in on 99%, and it's really like loss to follow-up that defines the few people who don't respond. And what agents were combined, they actually allowed more in the inclusion criteria, but in reality, this is what people were on. Um, but what you can't use with this new agent are favorins, and what you can't use are um, uh, protease inhibitors per the package insert. And so... Um, uh, this new medication is eight weeks for all and is the correct answer to your question, okay? Because it, it's newly approved and could be used if you can make it compatible for your co-infected patients, um, for patients without cirrhosis and naive to therapy. I'm over time now, I'm going into my question time, so I want to breeze through this a little bit, but um, there are numerous resources both online as well as um, uh, one is the University of Liverpool where you can uh, combine, like you can choose the regimen that you want to look at and combine it with your antiretrovirals. And guess what? At the University of Liverpool, you can look up any other medication that they're on virtually. It's a really wonderful site that I would heavily advise you to use. 
everyone needs. If you have a pharmacist, you just turn it over to them and have them run the list and go over everything, and it's wonderful. But if you don't, you can really learn to do this yourself and learn about these drug interactions. And so you just need to um, not only assess them at baseline, but also tell them about new drugs. One major drug is omeprazole, which is frequently prescribed, and some patients are on it for reasons they don't know, because it was started in a hospital and they just keep on it. But, uh, some, um, and so that interferes with a couple of um, drugs. The last message I want to leave you with is what happens if we do things like de-restrict access to a curative medical therapy? So there are only five states where the fee-for-service Medicaid are completely unrestricted by, by fibrosis. So you can treat someone early on, you can treat someone late in the course. Only five states. But here in the Netherlands, they de-restricted. In, in HIV clinics, where people are already linked to care, they saw a rapid uptake. So 70% of people took it up in that first year. Amazing. They had the capacity, the, the sort of treatment infrastructure. Interestingly, they did see a lot more uptake in MSM versus uh, women and versus pe uh, people who inject drugs. They still have disparities there in terms of who was interested in getting, or who was, I shouldn't say interested, able to get cured. But what was also interesting is that the next year they saw a 50% uh, decline in hep C rates, which is an STD in this clinic, in the, in, in the Netherlands. So that makes sense, right? If you're able to reduce the pool, able to infect others, you see a decline. Now, if we could achieve 70% in R, inject, uh, people who inject drugs, could you imagine the future savings? Um, and they did not see any change in rates of, uh, in this case, syphilis or LGV, indicating that it's not a behavior change that happened because of the hep C meds. It really was just fewer people out there to run into. So we're approaching the point where we can eliminate hepatitis C as a public health problem. Um, interestingly, one of the recommendations from this report, which is a comprehensive report, said that we should institute a Ryan White-like system for mono-infected patients. Now, could you imagine the scale of that? How many of you have expanded your hep C work into mono-infection? You're doing it. Are you doing it? You're kind of leveraging resources that you have, and I've heard of a wonderful project in Delaware presented at IDSA. You're on the ground doing this. And so what you're doing is changing this equation you're promoting um, harm reduction, you're screening, you're access staging, and you're improving the capacity to cure. And so hopefully we will see that middle shrink, and we won't see it because people are dying, but we'll see it because it cures. So assessing your approach, improving the ur cascade of care on multiple levels, improving liver health, and finally improving treatment access and capacity is really important. The last few slides are simply just resources that I left in the handout, so I'm not going to go over them. I'm going to finish here, and I hope uh, this has given everyone something about the new things going on in hepatitis C that are both exciting and novel. Okay, so we've got uh, questions. I'm going to start with one um, that is around uh, the rates of hepatocellular carcinoma. Mm. There's been a little bit here and there at meetings about increased rates of hepatocellular carcinoma after treatment. Do you have any yes. comment on that? Yes. So um, the controversy is really um, the original studies that showed interferon-based cures showed a radical decline in hepatocellular carcinoma, upwards of 80% risk for patients already with cirrhosis if you're cured. The difference um, between using the novel DAAs and, and interferon-based cures is interferon is antiproliferative and is actually was used for several cancers and is um, kind of still finding niches there, um, but particularly melanoma, you may recall, and some forms of leukemia, they would add it. And so it's, it's an antiproliferative. It's kind of an anti-cancer drug. And so one wondered whether there's a difference in effects when you're not using interferon to cure patients. And then there's a controversy whether the, these agents might somehow promote um, HCC. And I, I basically have to say the jury is out. There are believers and there are non-believers. There are people who've seen cases. I've seen um, more HCC in my clinic, but they're, you know, ha they also happen in patients who are not cured and also who, are not, um, who relapsed, who did not respond to the initial therapies. So for me to fault DAAs you know, on the basis of small numbers in my clinic, it's, it's going to take larger studies. The jury is still out. But it's a good question whoever is following the literature very closely. But you should definitely screen your patients well for, hips, for hepatocellular carcinoma. Yes? Hi, I didn't believe I'd ever do this in public, and you can't do this, but I would actually like to praise the manufacturer of the new uh, combination, the pangenotypic. Um, the price is 
$26,000, which is outrageous, <clears throat> for, two week, for an eight-week uh, course of treatment, which has undercut all the competition. And I'm in Mendocino County, and it has allowed my Medi-Cal uh, coverage to make it available to all our HIV patients um, without any questions. Well, great. I mean, uh, the, uh, co this is one case where competition did drive prices. I, uh, I, I guess I wouldn't be convinced if they were first <laughs> that they would have come up with that same number. But um, still, what they did um, to list that price for eight weeks, 26000 Would you exchange $26,000 for an infection that uh, is associated with 20 years of lost life? I mean, no brainer. So, uh, so hopefully we're reaching the point where the costs are low enough. And to be fair, some of the original companies have negotiated prices, even though they're listed at $1,000 a day. Their negotiated prices are actually kind of similar to that. Which, so the, the, the game is on, and it's a very good thing for our patients. Great. Um, so can you talk about more, a little bit more about reinfection after cure, and is there any sort of form of PrEP available for hepatitis C? Absolutely. Um, I wish I had uh, more time to go over all aspects of hep C and cure. Um, so, it's, so after you cure a patient, do you just say goodbye, you're cured? Well, um, we don't, because we really want to do two things. We want to promote liver health, particularly for cirrhotic patients, drink your coffee, avoid alcohol, et cetera, but then also avoid reinfection, and particularly for this um, uh, sort of newer crowd, the younger folks who are getting hep C, this is critical. And there are many ways that harm reduction can be applied. Ideally, you have a way to access substance use services, but even, you know, many patients are going it alone, not on methadone or, or, or suboxone or whatnot. And so for those patients, uh, they, are, they are at higher risk. The other thing I counsel young men particularly about are anabolic steroids. I've seen uh, a couple of reinfections as well as terrible bacterial infections from that. So these are all things that, you know, it's not just about prescribing eight to 12 weeks or something. There actually is still a bond going on with patients. And while at some point I do say goodbye to, to many because they are cured, uh, I try to convey as many messages as I can um, to prevent those things. So absolutely, harm reduction, clean needles, clean everything, clean tattooing, don't get your tattoo in the backyard of your uncle or whatever, you know, things like that. It happens, I mean, you see this. So, so, so uh, from the floor, can you say who you are and where you're from? Okay. Uh, in patients dually infected with hepatitis B and C, after being treated for hepatitis C, there is relapse of hepatitis B. Could you comment? Absolutely. So in the workshop, I hope to talk a little bit about that. So um, the FDA um, noted uh, uh, several cases um, of uh, hepatitis B reactivation in co-infected patients. These are largely viremic patients. So every case but one was in a patient who had some level of active replication, either by surface antigen or by hepatitis B DNA. There's one case which was that core only type of infection profile, which really threw a curveball. Subsequent studies have shown in hundreds of patients that they did not see rates uh, that were detectable of, of, um, of high rates of reactivation. And so what is my practice? For hep B viremic patients, it is, um, most of the patients will have some fibrosis, and so they pretty much meet criteria for hep B treatment anyway. And so I would treat for at least a few weeks with, um, a, you know, two to four weeks with a hep B active drug and then start the hep C therapy. And we know f because hep B active drugs are uh, HIV drugs, right? There's been studies, and so we know we can combine them safely. And then for patients who are core antibody positive only, meaning they harbor hep B probably, but they may, or may, they may reactivate if you immunosuppress them, but on hep C therapy, I think monitoring with ALTs at weeks eight and 12 are, is a reasonable pathway for them, and not necessarily doing, I do check one hep B DNA just to be sure we don't have this weird occult, I mean hep B is confusing, right? I will also try to answer that previous question of hep B because it's important. Um, yes, um, for iris and, and whatnot, you may contemplate treating hep B beforehand, but unfortunately you can't use really hep B agents as monotherapy, such as entecavir and tenofovir. Entecavir induces as monotherapy the M184V mutation, and so um, one can't leave it unprotected in the face of HIV viremia. And so, um, so what, what you said earlier is absolutely true. I just thought I'd go there since somebody mentioned Hep B. I hope that's helpful. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Art. Uh, thanks for a great talk. I'm Barbara Taylor from San Antonio, Texas. Sorry about the heat, y'all. Um, so my question is about acute Hep C. And I know this was a 30-minute talk, but could you talk a little bit about diagnosis and then what should we should be doing? Yes. That treatment. Right, so I, I took out that slide at some point in this, <laughs> trying to cut back, but, um, and I already went over, but acute hep C um, 
is, is the first six months uh, after infection. And uh, for HIV patients, there can be a seronegative window on average of three months, um, some studies suggest, rather than the usual four to six weeks in mono infections, so a slight delay in the antibody of unclear significance. Um, but um, it means you have a window in which it's really RNA testing that can be positive. And depending on the day, you may see the ALT increased. We've seen some people seroconvert tested monthly with ALTs with acute hep C. They tripled their ALT from 14 to 42. So, you know, these little clues could, you know, if you just see a change in the pattern, could be an indication of, of acute hepatitis C. So that's why I think reacting to LFTs um, is important, uh, as well as just being aware of this. And in our urgent care clinic, if somebody comes in with any sort of STD, he's immediately adding both antibody and um, RNA, you know, if not done recently. So, uh, so that's one approach to in our HIV positive MSM, as well as in um, uh, people who inject drugs. And whether you should treat or not is an area of controversy. Uh, I think uh, right now there are some studies in co-infected patients suggesting that eight weeks of lidipasir sofosphere and six weeks are sufficient. And so um, uh, six weeks is a little hard to get because you're breaking open a bottle anyway. But um, anyways, there's some thought that you could treat early with shorter courses, may maybe be more cost effective. But already we're re reaching the point where treatment has prevention. And someone mentioned the idea of PrEP. Um, PrEP is, unfortunately, at these prices, kind of uh, high at the moment, and, and you do have to think a little bit about resistance if patients aren't taking that very well. Um, and so right now, it's not considered a, um, a cost-effective approach to use either post-exposure prophylaxis or um, PrEP. Okay, so we've got several questions. We need a quick question, quick answer. So uh, what level of CD4 should people be at to be treated for uh, hepatitis C if they're co-infected? What level of CD4? So there actually are no specific um, guidelines regarding that. I do think that um, a couple things. Um, if you achieve HIV suppression and your CD4 counts are on the way up, that's great because you know, you're showing the patients and you are showing that they can be on medications. And so adding another medication for eight to 12 weeks, hey, that sounds very uh, reasonable. So uh, we recently had a 60-something-year-old gentleman um, who was using drugs, also engaging in high-risk sex, contract HIV for the first time. And so we treated the HIV first. We, let, um, we didn't care about the CD4 count and the threshold of increasing, and then we treated as hep C because um, even in the original days of interferon-based studies, CD4 count did not really fall out as a major influencer of uh, outcomes. So we do think these um, treatments are very effective even without um, CD4 counts. And we, I think I've heard several cases of like low CD4 recovery, mm -hmm. and I think you don't need to wait. You just treat the hep C if patients are in that phenotype. Okay, so how often do you retest for hepatitis C if someone is negative at their in Intake, initial yes. encounter? Yes, so um, to emphasize, I breeze through that slide quickly, it is important to test yearly. And so um, for antibodies, uh, is, is recommended and is cost effective. It's less costly than an RNA. Unfortunately, if the patient is already antibody positive and they're RNA negative, whether that's by treatment or they cleared it themselves, their screening from then on is hep C RNA. So that's the only way to catch a new infection. Okay, and what about uh, once a person has been cured of hepatitis C and they have cirrhosis, how often do you need to screen them for hepatocellular carcinoma? How do you do it? Too? Great question. So my practice is to use ultrasound. It's um, cheaper, more um, pallid, uh, 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 more acceptable to patients, and um, then MRIs and other things. You will hear for, if you go to different hep C talks, some people say use MRI all the time and all this. Um, in my practice, I use ultrasound. I believe that's the, and every six to 12 months for patients with F3 fibrosis or above because F3, uh, unfortunately, cannot rule out some parts of the liver that are closer to F4. Okay, we have a couple more questions about um, needle exchange. Maybe people can come up and talk about oh, that. Sure. We're just running out of time. But um, to point out that, that IAS USA does have some hepatitis C uh, workshops that are going to be going on in the fall. Um, this will conclude uh, the lecture part of the, of the day's events. We are going to have a 20-minute break, and at 3.20, uh, we'll have concurrent workshops. As yesterday, uh, you've been assigned to a workshop. If you choose to attend a different one, please wait in the back of the room till everyone can get in who's signed up for it and then take your seat after the lecture's begun or the interaction's begun. Um, and the t rooms have changed, so please check outside. Uh, thank you very much and thanks thank for that you. great talk.